I uh, feel really lucky to do this tonight. A uh, long time ago, months I guess, the, they picked the men for the various chapters, and I had no idea what I was going to do until a few weeks ago, and I looked at it and I said, man, this is just made for me. Uh -huh. Honestly, um, well, the title, for all of you that uh, read it and memorized every part of the book, uh, this is new, not new to you, but anyway, it says, willing to offer yourself to the leaders. Willing to offer yourself to leaders. I don't think that there's anything that I have had more emotional discussions with people in the church over the years, off the 40, than things that pertain to this chapter. You know, it's amazing that God gave me this one to do because it's really on my heart a lot of it. Um, and then God started to make things happen. Um, I've been reading, reading or listening to Marty Solomon on the Bama podcast. I wasn't too excited about that at first, but once I got into it, um, then he talks a lot about community, about the way, the way the church should look. And to me, this this chapter tonight um, is very important, very critical. And then uh, recently, uh, my daughter who's a, a, in Florida. She's working for a, a university, and she's been working on a master's degree and about leadership. And I've had some really amazing conversations with her, and that led right into this. And then uh, I'll wait for just a minute. And Made it tonight really special. So it's God's just been preparing. So what's really special about tonight for me is that I Bella and I have two of our grandsons here tonight. Sebastian, Benjamin, although now it goes by Ben. But of course, uh, from the Spanish it would be Sebastian and Ben Amin. So uh, growing up, it was Ben Amin and Sebastian. So now a little different. Sebastian Ben. So much yeah. Pardon? I said, so much. Yeah. Even he's, it's kind of short. No, Sebastian short, I don't think. Anyway, uh, it's really nice to have them here. Uh, Sebastian lives here in Knoxville, um, and Benjamin lives in Fort Lauderdale, works there, and uh, he had about a week off, and he just flew in. Boom. And Sebastian's between jobs and apartments, and so he's living with us. So we suddenly have the two of them in our house together, and it's like old times because for years we spent time together. When we had our house in uh, Crossville, they would come and spend four to six weeks every summer. And even since we've been a year, they'd come, and we were reminiscing a little bit today. But uh, some of you may know uh, their mom was Tina. Tina is Bell's youngest daughter or youngest child. She passed away two and a half years ago. So uh, it's uh, kind of bittersweet for us all to be together again like this. But uh, it's great to have them. And they're big guys now. And I was reminiscing about our days in Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale area. We were there. And Bill and I, and Bill and I were married about 10 years before these two even showed up. So we saw them both up and born. Um, we watched them grow up, and now they're big we guys. We babysit. Yes, we babysit a lot of times. <laughs> I remember Bill, she was, uh, and we lived right on the beach in Fort Lauderdale. She had this stroller thing that would carry both of them. And she would put these two guys in the stroller with their buckets, and sands, and all go across and spend all day in the sand. It was amazing. And I remember Sebastian when he was just a little tight, his dad never always laughed right in front of the computer. And still to this day, his dad and Sebastian are both on the computer and they together. And then Benjamin, uh, you had a lazy eye, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, totally. I agree that fine, but he used to look at the pictures that he dealt with the family. He would, he would sit and study those things like uh, just look at pictures. It was amazing. Um, we had a new, I don't to this day what we were thinking, but I had to do that. 
And then we, uh, here in, in Knoxville, we used to go to the Chick-fil-A and went there tonight. And uh, they used to have this pretty food. You dressed up like a cow. So they would dress up like cows. Uh, I didn't have to dress up. Maybe you didn't want anything like that. So uh, just had a move. It's it. um, <laughs> so anyway, um, we're having a, a great time, and this is what made it special. So I've made some notes here. I was told earlier by somebody who said, make a lot of notes and just pray that God will give you what to say. <laughs> That's what's happening. There you go. Okay, let's switch a little bit now to the book. Um, the uh, I'd like for those of you who have the book, turn to page 103. And uh, at the bottom, it says that leaders will have to answer to God for how they lead. But then it says members will have to answer to God for how they follow. I found that to be quite interesting. Um, this book is written by John Oates, and in talking to my daughter, I realized that there's a generational issue going on here. This book was written by a guy that's probably, he's about 65 now, he's older. And he's more like, like my generation. My generation was, do as you're told. Shut up, do as you're told. Uh, if you're told to do it, no discussion. Uh, children are to be seen and not heard. I mean, it's just, you just did what you're told. Today, it's more about, no, you better talk about it for a while. Don't feel like it. You've got to have to explain. You've got to work through it. And nothing wrong with that. It's just, boy, there's a big difference. And so this book appealed to me as I read it because this guy's more than bad thing. But I realized that there's part of this that maybe younger people don't quite grasp or jump into the same as maybe the older folks do. So I wanted to say that right up front. I think that when you read this, it's very like straight, hard and poor. I relate to that. But the principles here apply to everybody. And so we need to talk about it. That's what I love about the discussion is we can talk, we can get it out. We can Talk about what's going on. One of the questions that I gave, and I've got some handouts here, I used the word why. And my daughter said, why is very confrontational. It's almost judgmental. She says, well, right, what are your constituents? Wow, that's true. So if you read tonight where it says why, substitute the word obstacles. What are the obstacles for you? But because feelings and emotions are real. Now, in my day, it was right after during World War II. I looked up some statistics on World War II. Anybody in here have a guess of how many people were killed in the world in four years? Half a million. You aren't even. <laughs> 30 or 40 million. How many? 30 or 40 million. You're very close. 50 million people are killed. Four years. And we freaked out when there were 3,000 people killed in one day. We just don't have an understanding of what the world is like. You didn't have time to feel, think about how you felt. You had to move, you had to go, you had to jump into action. There wasn't time to say, well, I don't think I'm afraid of that. Oh, you didn't have time. Four years, 50 million people. And they built this old bridge out here, the largest factory in the world on the roof, in four years, and, and enriched the uranium to build the atom bomb. They built that whole thing in four years and used it and made the uranium. I mean, we couldn't even talk about it in four years, let alone get built today. I mean, we're just so far from the way people used to think. So that's kind of the, the world and the place that I'm thinking where we're coming from here. So communication here is key, I think, for this whole book. We've got to talk about there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done, but it really gets into your soul, into your mind, and you start to really embrace it. It doesn't really work. Um, 
talk about communication last uh, week at our family group. We, I knew I was going to do this, so I threw out one question, just a beginning question. Wow, did we have a conversation? What was so amazing is that uh, Marina, Marina Dantos, uh, started to share from her heart. And she is, she's able to speak English so much better than she is. And I was astounded. Uh, she brought out something that I don't think we as Americans had even had a remote awareness of. Most of the world, a lot of the world is very family oriented. Russia is very family oriented. Yvel came from the Latino, very family oriented. Here, we don't have families anymore. Everybody's scared all over. We don't think anymore. We don't have relationships that last for years and years. And so Marina was talking about how hard it is for her in the United States, first in Seattle and here, and the church there and here. There are not relationships. There are not deep family relationships. And yet when I Look at the Bible, and I also hear this guy, Marty Solomon. That's not the way the church really was intended to be. God intended it to be family. But boy, do we have to work on that. We don't have a clue on the family because they're so spread out. I mean, everybody leaves home, go here, go there. I mean, that's the way I was. Almost everybody in here. I mean, how many people in here are from Knoxville? Raise your hand. Four. That's right. Four. How many have been here? Who was here when CJ and Sheree were here? Look at that. They've been gone for five years. There's only half of us in here that we've been here five years ago. I mean, we just don't know what it is to have family anymore. So to have it, we've got to be intentional. So that's what I see. I think the principles in this book are amazing. And but we've got to be, we've got to be very intentional about our approach to this and want to really do this. And the only way it's going to happen is we're talking. We've got to talk about this. We've got to have family groups, one another. And if I just shut up, we'll get into talking about it. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. just kind of rambling, but it's going to have fun. I mean, this isn't what the chapter is all about. It's like I step back to the chapter and I said, this chapter is real stuff. But it's not going to happen until we really embrace it. Um, I remember family and two things. When I was with Miguel early on, one time we were in uh, uh, Venezuela. And her mother and her four sisters, a sister and mother, about six or eight women in the kitchen. They were talking simultaneous. Everybody knew what they were doing. And it was the most beautiful thing. They were cooking and they were working and they were, it was family. It was family. They knew each other. They could talk. They could talk. It was beautiful. And that's what I kind of did maybe when it was early on with my mother and her sisters. But that's a big generation of them. When they hit family. And then Benjamin was talking about he's been uh, training for an EMT, and he was telling me yesterday about what it's like being in a emergency room in the hospital. There may be 15, 20 people when somebody comes in the party and the rest, and most everybody in there knows everybody else's job. Everybody has a job, boom, they're all working together. So it's like watching the movie. Nobody says anything, it's just everybody knows what they're doing. It's like a team. Huh. And that kind of vision, you know, our church needs to be a family, needs to be a team. We need to have our ability, everybody contributing, knowing their gifts. When that's happening, things really start to flip. So that's sort of the intro into what this book, this chapter is all about. So all of this is just me rambling, okay? Sort of like uh, Justin, you got up here and I love it. So here's what the chapter is all about. The first thing is there's a basic assumption, and that is any organization has to have leadership to function. And I thought, 
What would happen if I just said, you know what? I think I'm going to take the leave next hour. And I'm just like that. What would happen? Who would take a spot? Somebody would have to step up. <laughs> just chaos. Just chaos. There actually has to, there has to be leadership. Unfortunately. So for a church, there actually has to be movement. There has to be a leader. Now, we always say that Jesus is our leader, but he has to live in someone. He has to, we have to have a leader. So on in the book, if you would please turn to me in uh, page 95, right at the beginning. And it says that the church needs good leadership, but it also needs good membership again. So you can't have church function sort of like the wings of the plane. You've got to have a leader who knows that follows. If you've got a good leader, nobody does anything. It doesn't work. So it's essential that we understand that we can't be just a spectator. We have to be involved in the work. And uh, and then on page 96, and this leads into where we're starting our discussion. The next page on 96, like on the second paragraph, it says that the church functions best when it has a strong, decisive, visionary, and godly leader. Strong, decisive, visionary, godly, and also, by the way, humble. That's the kind of leader that you need. Now, what my question is, and the question number one, are you ready? Are you ready for a leader? We don't know who we're going to get yet. Are we going to get some fired up guy that's going to be close out there and you're going to go, oh, not ready for this? <laughs> or is it going to be a pastor? Everything's kind of nice and family and Somebody's saying, well, where are we going to start inviting people? You know, what kind of a leader? We don't know what God does. We just don't know. But you, are you ready? Are you really ready for a leader? I looked at this and I said, are we really ready for this? Where is your heart? Where is your thing? Where's your mind? Are you ready to jump in whoever comes along? That leads us into the second question that you're going to look at. And it's all about trusting the leadership. Do you really believe that God is personally involved for whoever we do? Or are you going to have doubt? You know, David is a great example of having to follow a bad leader. Just because you have a bad leader doesn't mean that you don't have to follow him. Now, if he's doing something illegal or immoral, yeah, but it's a challenge to follow a bad leader. Sometimes it challenges the fired up people too. That's hard as well. How many of you get out of your comfort zone? So the second question is all about trusting a leader. And by the way, uh, Jesus was a fearless leader. He was fearless. Think about it. That was what attracted people to him. But you could have a bad leader. Third question is what's holding you back? And that's what, what are the obstacles in your life that would cause you to not want to jump into the leader? What is it? You know, if you have a, a leader that's calling you to do things, what is it that causes you to go back? Um, the third, the fourth question is Are you part of the problem or part of the solution? Are you see something missing or something wrong in the church? What's your attitude? Do you Jump in and try to be part of the solution, or do you just complain? That's something we all need to talk about. And uh, Matthew 18 15, I've seen so many times, that's about just go directly to the person. So many times we want to talk about somebody else, just go directly to the person. So many problems that go away. So those are a couple things to think about. Then the last thing. Question is about encouraging the chapter. So it's not about encouraging, encouraging your leaders. I mean, how many people go up to the sound crew on Sunday and say, Man, it's really great today? 
Probably, hey, I couldn't hear the speaker was crackling or something like that. We complain, but I mean, every Sunday, you guys come set up, they down uh, song choices. There's so many ways we, ways we can encourage. And another way to encourage a big one is using your gifts. Are you, you encourage the leadership by jumping in and being part of the, the activities of the church? So there's so many ways that we can encourage. Uh, especially as we've been talking about a few weeks ago, using your gifts. That is a way that leadership can be encouraged. So those are my thoughts. Um, I do have some books. I've got, I've got one copy of the one of my book. One copy of the questions. They were distributed. We uh, can bring them to uh, groups. You know what? We've got those here. Almost. The fours kind of are nice. They could break, break up into fours after the way you're sitting. Would be pretty good. Any questions? Good, right? oh, thanks, Let's go ahead.